back here on HQ Spotlight as the NFL draft inches closer. Kayla Williams as QB1 in Chicago. Seems more and more like a sure thing, Tommy. The Bears, of course, a couple weeks ago trading former quarterback Justin Fields to the Steelers, leaving us with little doubt as to what they're going to do with that number one overall pick happening in just a few weeks at the draft in Detroit. So who goes number two overall? That's kind of what we're talking about here. Some mocks have the commanders taking quarterback Jaden Daniels, but it is a deep receiver class. So who goes off the board first? Is it going to be Marvin Harrison Jr.? There's been a lot of folks recently high on Malik Neighbors. His draft stock has been on the rise. And our with the first pick podcast crew, Ryan Wilson, Rick Spielman, they took the old uh, with the first pick RV for a spin and they went to LSU's Pro Day and they saw Malik Neighbors, went to Baton Rouge, saw him in person. Speaking of Ryan Wilson, this is his latest big board. So we're ranking all the players, not a mock draft, but just based on talent alone. Of course, we have Kayla Williams coming in right there at number one. Malik Neighbors comes mm -hmm. in at number big two. Riser, yeah, riser. he has been a big riser. Marvin Harrison Jr. rounding out the top three there. You see Jaden Daniels on the board at six. Brock Bowers number seven. Drake May rounding out the top 10 and Ryan's final big board. This is not it. We'll see that in a couple of weeks, but we have Ryan Wilson, the man himself and BMAC to go down the big board. And of course, there is a lot of talent when it comes to receivers in this upcoming draft class. We saw Malik neighbors coming in at number two on that list. Marvin Harrison Jr. coming in at number three and Ryan, I'll start with you because you and Rick were at LSU's pro day and you saw neighbors in person. So kind of explain that two, three with neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. on that list that we just saw. So, Jacqueline, a few things. Uh, neighbors and Marvin are incredibly close, and if you took one over the other, I wouldn't be angry at you. But let's back up a week before last week, two weeks ago, I got a phone call from someone named Brian McFadden talking about Malik versus Marvin. And we were having the conversation that, look, man, if Marvin goes, if Malik goes to the pro day and runs in the four threes, we're going to have to have a conversation about what this looks like because Marvin hasn't done anything since last fall and we know who he is as a player we know all the things he can do on the field but when you're Malik neighbors and you run in the four threes you have a 42 inch vertical you have a uh, bench press of, of 15 plus and then a, a long jump of, of 10 and a half feet to go with the tape in 2022 or 2023 excuse me it's a lot easier to do the math that, okay, if you're a team that loves Malik Neighbors and he's more Jamar Chase in terms of the comp and, and uh, you want to take him with, with your first-round pick over Marvin Harrison, I get it. I will not push back on that. Marvin Harrison is probably more of a Larry Fitzgerald type. Again, Hall of Famer, no doubt about it. But the things that Malik Neighbors can do, and I think BMAC would agree, short and intermediate routes, he, there's no one twitchier than he is, including Marvin Harrison Jr. You see the, the deep speed there, and that shows up on tape. I love both these players. I would take both these players if I were the Arizona Cardinals number four. If they took Malik over Marvin, I get it. If they took Marvin over Malik, I get that too. But I think Marvin, or excuse me, Malik proved himself over the last month or so of the pre-draft process uh, as to why he certainly deserves to be in the consideration for wide receiver one. Yeah, uh, we've been having ongoing conversations, Ryan, when you talk about text messaging and communicating of, uh, uh, on a lot of different players. But as of late, it's been about these two guys. And the thing that Malik Neighbors has provided, because he worked out during his pro day, he has provided a new sense of conversation. And when you, when you converse about players, you now start to think about players. Before his pro day, it's safe to say the majority of analysts, experts, fans, probably would have catered to Marvin Harrison Jr. being the ultimate wide receiver one for this draft. But Marvin did not do anything pre-draft related to create separation from the others, from the pack. So because of his inability, for whatever reason, to not perform, it, it gave an opportunity for a guy like Malik Neighbors to kind of gain traction, to be right there with Marvin Harrison Jr. as the potential wide receiver one option or to surpass Marvin Harrison Jr. And that's what I said to uh, Ryan last week. If Malik goes out and does X, Y, and Z, this is a different conversation as we get ready for the NFL draft in late April. And he was able to do that. All he did was confirm what we've watched throughout his collegiate career, especially a year ago, when you factor in the tape and then working out individually for the NFL teams. That 4-3, it confirmed what we've watched on tape the, the the broad jump the vertical it confirmed what we watched on tape and also too, ryan you know this going through to, to as many 
uh, uh, pro days that you've been to, one thing you get an opportunity to see these guys outside of what you watch during games is see how they look outside their uniform. That actually helped guys because now you get a chance to see a guy, wow, he's well put together. He's more defined than what I thought. And when you talk about wide receivers, that's important because of the durability concerns or the lack thereof and being tough. So when you factor in everything that Malik Neighbors did during his pro day compared to what Marvin Harrison decided to not do, this is a different conversation than what many people were having two or three weeks ago, heck, even months ago when you factor in how the collegiate season ended. And just a reminder, you can find Ryan's full list right now over on CBSSports.com. It is a loaded receiver class. Let's get back to the quarterbacks because after Caleb Williams at the top, you have Jaden Daniels, Ryan at number six, and then Drake May at number 10. So, BMAC, are you on board with those rankings on Ryan's big board, Jaden Daniels at six and Drake May at 10? Yeah, job well done. I have no issue with Jaden Daniels being ranked higher than Drake May. I know there are a lot of people are trying to put Drake May in that Jaden Daniels conversation in Jaden Daniels' neighborhood, but me personally, I'm not doing it because Drake May is a real good player, but he's not Jaden Daniels, right? Jaden Daniels, when you just let's just forget about all the pre-draft process, the interviews and things like that. If you turn on the tape, who has the better tape? It's easy. It's Jaden Daniels. Who's been more consistent, especially a year ago? It's Jaden Daniels, the guy who has really flourished and evolved to be a outstanding player to, compared to what he was years ago has been Jaden Daniels. So just watching the tape alone, there shouldn't be a, a, a conversation, a concern for either guy, uh, Drake May being a guy that could surpass Jaden Daniels because Jaden Daniels has been the best quarterback out of the two. Heck, just going back to solely 2023, there's no other quarterback that was better in college football than Jaden Daniels. And I'm throwing in Caleb Williams' names in, in that hat as well because Jaden Daniels was the best quarterback in college football, hint <laughs> the Heisman uh, Award that he was able to accomplish. So me personally, I have no issue with Jaden Daniels being ranked where he is on Ryan's big board and seeing Drake May be being positioned where he is because I think that's the deserved spots. Ryan, let's talk about some quarterbacks that are just outside of the top 10. They're actually a little bit farther down outside of the top 20. You have J.J. McCarthy at 25 and then Michael Penix Jr. right at 26. Now, there is a sense out there that if all the medical clears for Penix, he's a top 15 pick. But why are you giving J.J. a slight edge over Michael Penix Jr. on your big board? So, Jacqueline, what do we always say and what do scouts and, and, and front office types always tell you? At the end of the day, you got to go back to the tape. Okay, let's go to the tape, BMAC, and let's see what Michael Penix Jr. did in 2023. And what does that look like? That looks like a guy that almost took that Washington team to a national title. Yes, he lost to Michigan and J.J. McCarthy, but I think a lot of it had to do with the run game for Michigan and how good that Michigan defense is. We're going to end up having what feels like 20 guys drafted by the time it's all said and done. But Michael Penix Jr., to me, his tape is second only to what we saw from J.J. McCar uh, from Jay Daniels, excuse me, in 2023. Best deep ball thrower in this draft class. Yes, he was throwing to Duke on the outside that's not his fault yes he was pl playing behind a great offensive line also not his fault but he can sling it he has 10 and a half inch hands and he can spin it like no one else in this draft and there's some guys with some hoses now JJ McCarthy on the other hand I have him ranked as a low first round pick because that's what I saw on tape and we've talked about this to death uh, Jacqueline he wasn't asked to do a whole bunch of Michigan because he didn't need to now when you talk to him there's not a more charismatic person that you can have a conversation with in this draft class he's a great team leader his teammates love him. He has the athleticism and arm strength and physically looks like you want a quarterback to look. But you're having to do some projections. And if you told me he went in the middle of the first round, I'd be more power to you. If you told me you're trading two first round picks to get him at number four, number five, I'm going to have some questions. And that's where I'm at on J.J. He could have a great NFL career. But based on the tape, I think Michael Penix Jr. has been a better football player to this point in their careers. Let's talk about a pair of Bama corners. We have Terry and Arnold, and he is at 16 on Ryan's big board. And then Kool-Aid McKinstry, who comes in at number 40. So, BMAC, I'll ask you, is there really that much of a drop-off, in your opinion, from those two corners? And Lee is in studio, and he is nodding his head yes off camera. Man, listen, the thing about these two corners, teammates, going into the collegiate year a year ago, Jacqueline Ryan, Kool-Aid was the guy. He was the more talked about player at that position. And then when you watch them play September, October, November, December, January, Terion put, put better tape out. Terion was more consistent. Terion displayed NFL-like technique and NFL-like skill set. And one thing I love about Terion is his line of scrimmage game. When you talk about being at the LOS, 
how disruptive he is at the point of attack and bump and run coverage and just being able to mirror wide receivers using the motor mirror technique to his best and being able to attack the football. I mean, he played his way into being potentially the best cornerback in college football because as I stated, going back to summer workouts, getting ready for the season for 2023, he wasn't considered the best cornerback on his team, but he played his way into this position and now you see him rank higher than Kool-Aid in Ryan's big board, and that is deserving because he played his way into these positions. He's played his way into these conversations. I'm not saying Kool-Aid is not a gifted, talented cornerback, but when you talk about these two, yes, Terion is the better guy based on what we've watched throughout a full season of play going back to 2023. Like I said, his biggest skill set is his hands. I mean, he's a fighter, and he loves using his hands when it comes to disrupting wide receivers, messing up the timing, and just being able to mirror these wide receivers as well. Athletically, he's a gifted guy. No, he didn't run the 40 times that a lot of people thought he would he would run. But think about this, Ryan. He is such a gifted player. The 4-5 that he ran at Indy is not hurting him. People still believe he is the consensus best cornerback in the draft, and it's all about his tape and the potential that he has going forward in the NFL. I have Terry and Arnold right up there with Quinion Mitchell as cornerbacks 1 and 1A, basically. And look, Kool-Aid had a really good season. He did run the 447 at his pro day BMAC, so we got a sense that he actually is fast. Uh, uh, straight line, just like we saw on tape. I have him as my cornerback 6 going pretty high in the second round, so he's still a good football player. But to your point, he didn't have the season that Terry on did, and Terry on went from a guy who plays opposite of Kool-Aid to Jacqueline, a guy who's going to be one of the first defensive players drafted once we get to April 25th. Ryan BMAC, we appreciate it going down Ryan's big board just about three weeks to go until the NFL draft. And of course, you can hear Ryan on the With the First Pick podcast. Him and Rick Spielman, they have mock drafts, big boards. They are releasing everything you need to know leading up to draft day. You can download a listen wherever you get your pods or scan that QR code on your screen.